Last week when, when, um, when we met together, um, that last week was the second Sunday, wasn't it? Yeah. So last week, the second Sunday, worshipers were here. Um, <laughs> we, we have this little running joke here at Manor that every Sunday it's a different group, you know, it's just... <laughs> I, I yearn for the day when, when, um, and I'm not talking about those that are sick or out vacation and you know working or what have you, but I, I yearn for the day when every saint of manna is here. And okay, so maybe I have to wait until I get to heaven to see that, but <laughs> but um, even so. But last week when we, were, when we were sharing, I was talking about this wonderful experience that I had on, on a boat fishing. Um, uh, Brother Robbie, Brother Waters, and a few others, and Charles, and a few others were out there on a boat on, on the uh, Chesapeake Bay. And I, for one reason or another, I didn't complete my story. And all you heard was the little tiny guppies that I caught, you know. Two, just two, and I, I was just I was just beside myself, and, and nobody knew it. You know, they didn't they didn't know, but in my, my God knew it. You know, I, I'm praying, God, really, come on, really, they were hauling them in buckets. Brother Smith, Elijah Senior, and his, his son Elijah, they they had they were dropping rigs that they you know where you can get three fish on on one pole and pulling them up and i'm i'm looking at this and saying and all that elijah could say favor is not fair <laughs> god favored god was favoring them no doubt so i just whispered a prayer in my heart lord really come on help me out here i don't want to go home to tracy with just this for all the time I've spent, this is it. So it wasn't long after that when, when uh, I dropped my line again. And, and uh, I, I felt this tug, this tug. And it was, it, I said, whoa, what is that? And immediately I thought, well, I, okay, I, maybe I'm hooked on somebody else's line. But I, I started reeling it in, reeling it in. And to my utter amazement, I caught a catfish. That dude was about this. Okay, no, no. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, all right, no. But he was big. He was about that big. And I, I, was, I was thrilled. I was just so happy that the Lord sent that catfish my way. And, and I really just so enjoyed that, that um that experience, and yet greater than that was the extraordinary fellowship of brothers in Christ laughing together, sharing together, telling stories of their life, exchanging life with each other. That, that is priceless. Catfish will come and they will go. But fellowship with deep, intimate fellowship with brothers who know Jesus Christ is rich and priceless. And, and so I, I thank the Lord for those men. We're going to be doing more trips, not just for catching fish, but, but for the fellowship. And, and it happens whether we're out fishing on the bay. It happens in Bob Evans. <laughs> it happens in McDonald's. It happens in, in homes. It happens, yes, in church, of course. It happens no, no matter where the people of God go and gather. When the people of God gather together, the Lord himself manifests his presence in us and through us. There is a connection unseen to the natural eye, but it's an experience that is known in, internally in the inner man. And, and you know what? Only God can do that. 
it you you can't you can't you can't imitate it. <laughs> you, you can't. It, it, it's not artificial. It's just a natural, supernatural manifestation of God's presence in His people, and and uh, it it validates this this marvelous um, passage here in the book of Ephesians. This series that we've been working on is is looking at the idea, the concept of serving the body. That when just just a little a quick snippet when when God transformed my life and when he transformed your life as a believer he put us in a body a community of faith and the intention is that in that community of faith that community of faith that network of godly people will use those spiritual gifts in each other's lives to develop us that's that's how God does transformation he transforms people spiritually but through other people using their gifts to that end I, I want to I want to encourage Saints again relative to this this wonderful passage and and I, I know we've been here a number of times and as I stated last week we um, we recognize that we we don't we don't always catch the reality of what God is saying on the first pass it's it's like we we get a little you know and by the way when when I had when I had that um when I was out there fishing it was one time a few times in fact where I put the line down and and um when you're fishing you got to use bait right and so you got to cut the blood worm up mm -hmm. <laughs> you got to cut the blood worm up and and here you, you know what one of the mistakes i think i, I was making i was trying to be economic <laughs> yeah i was trying to put just a little nibble on the hook elijah said you got to feed those fish. <laughs> you, you, you want them to bite? Give them something to bite. But you can't pull a little nibble. Well, that's what I was doing. And no wonder they weren't biting. But this one time, um, maybe a couple of times, I felt the, the little tug. And, and I pulled it up, and the fish was gone. Amen. Gone with my, my, my worm, my, my, my bait. Yeah. Gone. And, and that little nibble, he got away with it. What, what kind spiritual growth is like that Amen. We, we don't get the whole bite and we're done it doesn't happen like that we 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 nibble because because of capacity we we don't have the capacity and i'm just being honest none of us has the capacity to know the fullness of god instantly right now here this moment forever and ever number one he's infinite so to know god infinitely you have to be infinite yourself and since we're not infinite we're finite it means that we have to sort of nibble and piece our way toward a, a greater larger understanding and and so what what it requires for us as bible teachers is is to understand that that people learn not not by just dumping information but by processing their understanding so that so that um, as as learners as learners we're, we're getting a little here um, week after week and we're building on something greater and and to that end I, I just want to suggest that that's why um, repetition of this truth in a different way gives a fuller understanding oh there it is and, and frankly that's how I learn and, and I, I just believe that that's the, the, um, the, the best way to approach it um, as, as a Bible teacher. So here I am right back at Ephesians chapter 3. And we want to approach this now for the, the time that remains. Three things I want to draw to your attention from this passage. 
Uh, one is there is this idea of Paul where he talks about the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. And he, he recognizes the great privilege that he has. Extraordinary privilege. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 3 and starting with verse 8. Are you there? He says to me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given. What grace? The grace of God that he bestowed on Paul, this gift, this favor that he bestowed on Paul, that he would understand the mystery. What a, what a wonderful privilege that God gives us to know what he's doing so that he, he now has a better view, a, a panoramic view, historic, present, and future of what God is doing, has been doing from ages past. The Lord revealed it to Paul in that instant. Can you imagine the elation, the joy in his heart? As he begins to, I'm, I'm sure what he saw was Old Testament scripture. He himself was a Pharisee. He himself was a teacher of the law. And now when Jesus reveals to him the eternal mystery of God that was hidden, and he finally sees now the Old Testament for Paul is making sense. Amen. Because Jesus revealed the mystery that was hidden. And, and so it's, it's grace. Grace. God. And so it wasn't Paul's wisdom. It wasn't his knowledge. It wasn't his ability. It wasn't his intellect. Nobody is smart enough to impress God. Okay, maybe some of you are, right? <laughs> I mean, I just thought that, that that would just get a, a, a rising amen. <laughs> but some of us think that we can compete on an infinite level. And that's unfortunate because we can't. We're, we, we, we don't even. I, I love the way God dealt with Job. Job who assumed that he knew stuff. And so God took him through this, this uh, the, the question and answering. He didn't, didn't let Job answer, but he just kept hitting him with questions. Job, you think you all that intellectually? Tell me, Job, where were you when I formed the heavens and the earth? And before, before Job could uh, 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 hit him with another question, just bam, 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 bam. And, and just demonstrating the futility of human wisdom in the face of infinite knowledge. We, we, we're not smart. And, and so everything that we know in terms of God is a gift. It's grace that God reveals himself to us. And it's not through human effort. Jesus said to the disciples, um, who do men say that I am? Amen. He took a poll. He took a poll. You know, like we take polls today. You know, if you were to take a poll and ask, uh, you know, what do they think of the president, right? Um, you, 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 uh, yeah, I know. But <laughs> you, you, you'd get mixed answers, right? Well, Jesus took a poll. He says, what are they saying about me out there? I've been teaching now. What are they saying? And, and some, he, he said, some say you're the prophet. Some say you're Elijah. They, they saw in him this, this great ability to be a, a speaker on behalf of God. You, you, and you're just a great teacher. And, and then Jesus, okay, that's enough of the poll. Jesus looked at the 12, the disciples that he had been with for three years. Getting ready to go to the cross, he says to them, okay, now that's, that's the public. Now I want to know what the private thought. What, what's your thought? Who do you say that I am? He's, he expects that they would have a, a more informed understanding of who he is. Spend three years, intimate time with him. Who do you say I am? And, and Peter, in, in his own inimitable style, he said, you are, and quite emphatically, you are, as if to point. He pointed with his words, with an emphasis, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus looked at Peter, and he said, Peter, you know what? Flesh and blood didn't give you that. You didn't figure that out on your own. 
you're not so smart, Peter. You ain't all that. He says, Peter, my father revealed that to you. My father opened your understanding. And you know what? Paul recognized the grace of knowing the plan of God is a grace gift. That not everyone has the privilege of knowing the plan of God. What a grace given gift that we have today. We are, are among the elite. God's elite. And, and he, he does marvelous things with his elite. What does he do? He gives them grace. He gave, them, gave Paul the grace that he should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. This is the, the idea of the declaration of the unsearchable riches. That, that's an idea that I wanna, want you to nibble on. Just, you know, when you leave here this, this uh, today, that, that will be one of those little bites at this, 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 uh, this bait. This bait, because it is my intention to allure you. It really is. To spiritually draw you to where the Spirit of God wants you to see what Paul saw. And I know, you know, each time we look at this, you know, we didn't get it the first time, maybe the second, but, but we, we, want, we want to labor until, until the people of God are, are beginning to see what, what uh, God revealed to Paul about these uns the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is in incomprehensible in his nature. No one can fully understand Jesus Christ. And the fact that we have some understanding is a gift of grace. Without the grace gift, you know what we do? We create our own God. Instead of using the revelation, we use the imagination. We begin to imagine God is like that which he is not. There, there, there are millions, millions of false gods. Every human being, every human being was created with the capacity to know God. And when we don't fill that vacuum with the knowledge of the true God, we're filling that vacuum, that hole, with the knowledge of an idol. We're filling that. We, we, we're, we were created to worship God. And if we don't worship the true and the living God who fixes holes, we're going to worship a false God. We're going to worship something or somebody. It might be, it might be the, the latest rapper. It might be Beyonce. It, it might be presidents. It, it, might be, it might be music. It might be money. It might be, it, it could be anything that fills the void in your soul where God belongs. And he's offended that anyone, anyone that he created in his image would worship anything else but God. It's an offense. It's called idolatry. And so when we know Jesus, wow. It's the incomprehensible. And now here's the tension. Here's the tension. The, the tension is he's incomprehensible. We, we can't fully know him, but yet we can know him. What, what are you saying? What I'm trying to say is that we can't absolutely know him in every aspect of his infinite being. He's God. And he manifested himself in flesh. And, and yet, at the same time, he is incomprehensible to know him. In fact, he declares himself to be Alpha and Omega. He declares himself to be the beginning, the ending. How do, how do you know somebody who knows the beginning, who created the beginning, who himself is the beginning? How do, how, how, well, this, this is what you do. See, this is what God did. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit manifested their glory in the person of the Son of God. 
God became a man so that God, the unknowable God, the incomprehensible God, could be made known. So what we're to begin to understand about the incomprehensible God is to be seen in Jesus Christ. So if you want to know God and you're ignoring Jesus, you're going to pick an idol. If you want God, seek Jesus. Because he is called, in Scripture, he is called the image of the invisible God. He's the visual image. See, in, in humanity, in humanity, we need, we need to see something, right? We, we put a lot of stock in, in the senses, what we feel, touch, taste, smell, and what? What did I leave off? Here. We, we put a lot of stock in our senses, and, and th those senses are taking a lot of people to hell. They, they just are. They just are. They, they just are. They want to feel something, and, and, and so they drink it. They put it in their arms. It, it, any way we can, we, we want physical experience. That stuff becomes an idol. Well, well, God recognized the physicality of our existence. God, who is spirit, infinite spirit, takes on humanity, became a man so that we could see him. One of his apostles said, we have beheld him with our eyes. We have touched him. He's the image. The word, the word image there in, in, in the original language when Paul wrote this, he didn't write it in English, but the word he used was the word icon. Jesus is the icon of God. For those of you who know um, or have computers, and I think most of us are exposed in some level to computers, but you have, you have your, your um, home page, right? And your home page is filled with icons. And depending upon what you want to do, if you want to write a letter, you need to go to the word icon, right? And then when you put your cursor on the word icon, on that icon, everything that word or publisher or whatever icon you put, everything that they have is available to you through what? The icon. If you want God, put the cursor of your life on the icon of Jesus Christ. Everything, all that God is is at your disposal in Jesus Christ. He is called the icon of God. He is the creator of heaven and earth. In him, the Bible says, dwells the fullness of God bodily. And there's another tension. How do you get the infinite God, the creator of heaven and earth, how do you get him into a mother's, into a as a baby into a womb of a, of a woman? I don't know. But God did it. See, that, that, that's, that's the ability of God, that he, he has supernatural ability. That is, he has ability that transcends the natural ability. He goes beyond what you think, what you can say. He is super. He is above and beyond. He transcends the natural. And to say that, um, that, that um, he was a man only, you miss. You, that, that, is not, that is not what the, the Bible, the Bible reveals, that Jesus is the God-man. The fullness of who God is dwells in him. And yet he's fully man at the same time, according to Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. The mystery of God seen in Jesus. And he's called the head of the church. He's the head of the church. So the head of the church is not the pastor. The head of the church is not the priest. It's not the prophet and not the pope. Did I get all the peas? The head of the church is Jesus Christ. Meaning what? He has authority over the body which he created called saints. That every believer is under the authority of Jesus Christ. What Paul said, Paul said he has given me this privilege of seeing the mystery of what God is doing through the incomprehensible nature of Jesus Christ. Look at, look at what he says. He, he says that I might declare the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Then there is the demonstration of the manifold wisdom of God. Paul recognized that God was doing something 
unseen to, to the human mind. And yet he was, he was at work. He was at work. Yeah, that there was a demonstration of his manifold wisdom. Look, look at this in, in verse 10. He says, to the intent, though in the past the mystery was hidden, but in the present, the mystery has been made known through Jesus Christ. To what, per, to what point? To the intent or for the purpose that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. So what do we have in the church? What we have in the church is that the church is, as I've stated in the past, that we are part of an eternally majestic and divine initiative. Jesus said, upon this rock, that's what he told Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Amen. You know, man, man has been trying to destroy the church for a long, long time. Since, since, Jesus, since Jesus founded the church, they've been trying to kill, destroy, and utterly decimate the church. And the church goes on because of the power of God. Jesus said, even the gates of hell, everything that hell, hell can, hell bring it on, bring it on. All of the host, the demons of hell cannot overthrow what Jesus is doing in the church. It's an eternally majestic divine initiative. You and I are a part of that as believers. I mean, if you want to invest your life in something, invest your life in something that won't pass away. Now, now you can, you can, you can uh, seek to become, let's say if you sought to become the, the richest person who ever lived, right? Um, and and Jesus, Jesus said, what, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, and then loses his soul. See, everything, everything we gain in this life, we're going to leave it right here. And, and, you know, as I pan, maybe, maybe you will become the richest. But what good is it if you got to leave it here? See what I'm saying? I want something that I can take with me when I leave here. I, I want something that is substantive, meaningful, and that has eternal significance, and that can only be found in what God is doing. So we, as believers, are part of an eternal, uh, majestic, divine initiative. We have a wonderful grace privilege to be a part of what God is doing. God's eternal purpose, his power, and his plan is uniquely expressed in the church. That's what he's saying here in, in verse uh, 10, that the principalities, the demons, the fallen angels, principalities and powers, rulers of heaven, or rather rulers of, of the air, powers in, of wickedness, the rulers of the kingdoms of, of this world, all of them. God is demonstrating to all of them through the church his manifold wisdom. It's a demonstration of God's wisdom. How does God, how does God do his thing through people with holes, broken, distorted, messed up, can't seem to get it together. Oh, now, now I'm, I'm, that's all of us. You know that, right? So that, that hole does represent the rea our reality, that we got stuff that, that just, just, but God is at work in us to what? Fix it. And yet this, this is the marvel. This is the marvel that unto him who's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above what we could ask or think through the power that works in us. God is able. And he's able to do it flawlessly. And, and that, that's, that's the distinction of the church. As, as the, he demonstrates his glory, his wisdom through the church, and then there is this distinction um, that we have, that we uniquely portray God's marvelous wisdom. This, this, uh, 
thing called the church, it, it, um, it bears his identity. Because he says here in the, in the passage, in, in verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Verse 14 says, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So our identity as the church is, is intimately connected with God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. His name is upon us. His glory is upon us. His nature is in us. So he's doing something extraordinary in us. And no, it's not going to show up on CNN. No, it's not going to show up on local newscasts. If it, if, if it doesn't bleed, it won't lead, you know? I'm not going to talk about anything unless somebody's getting shot, killed, stabbed, or whatever. But, but, but what doesn't sell is, is, what, is, is what is beneficial. And the church is making its presence known in this footprint. Manna's footprint is here in this community, and you will not see it on WJZ TV. The, the lives that are being touched and transformed as we, com as we communicate the gospel, as we come in contact with our community. God is at work through us. It's a marvelous work. And if you're not engaged in the body of Christ, then you're missing God's plan for your life. You're missing it. And I want to say this, fundamentally, our spiritual formation begins and continues and is sustained by the corporate connection to the body. Amen. See, it's the body, it's the church where God is actively engaged. The, the nexus of his, of his energy is the church. It's the zenith of his power is expressed in the church. And if you're not engaged in the church, then you're missing what God is doing. Amen. And a lot of folk feel like, you know what, I, I don't have to go to church. Well, you're, you're missing what God is doing. Amen. Because you, you, you can't, you can't, God is not, work in li, not at work in Living Room Baptist Church. Oh, yeah? God is not at work in Living Room Baptist Church. He just isn't. He's at, he's at work in the community of faith. And, and so when people say, I, I don't want to go to church, it's because they're not connected vitally to God. That's really, that's ultimately what it is. People who are vitally connected to Jesus Christ, what he does, he puts them in a body. He saved us and put us in the body of Christ. And if we're, not, if we're not corporately connected, then we're not connected to what God is doing. And, and right now, I, <laughs> some, somebody is, I'm, I'm not one of those uh, television um, preachers. <laughs> Put your hand on the, te on the television. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm, I'm just looking at human nature. With, with when, when, whenever, whenever a dogmatic statement comes about, the, the dogmatism, the dogmatic statement raises the ire of our natural inclination. When I say God is not at work in Living Room Baptist Church, and, and when I say that you are not connected, if you're not connected to a church, I know what's happening in your spirit. In your spirit, in, in many, in the spirit of many, there is this pushback. And, and basically some are saying, I'm assuming, some are saying, I don't get what he says. I'm going to do this thing my way. And all I have to say to you is put, that, put it down. Put it down and back away from it. Yeah, put your hands up and surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ. If you're saved, he's your lord. And if he's your Lord, then you, you and I need to submit to him. 
And so fundamentally, fundamentally, we're, we're not. He doesn't set us loose to create our own spiritual reality. He has designed the method by which you and I should grow spiritually. He has designed the method by which he wants to fix that hole. And how does he do it? I want to read some passages of Scripture, and I want you to turn with me. And, and so we're, 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 uh, we're just about done. Um, and, you know, I realize that our capacity for spiritual things is, you know, limited. So I don't, I don't want to um, uh, take you too far too long. It's going to take you too far too long. And I might be here by myself for a while. So, uh, yeah, right. Brother, Brother Mike said he's going to be here with me, right? God bless you, man. Thank you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look, look at this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, now, once again, now what I'm trying to do is, is demonstrate why I said what I said is truth. What did I say? I said fundamentally, spiritual formation grows because we're connected, vitally connected, intimately connected to the corporate body, the body of Christ. And right now, the local church becomes the expression of the universal church. Man of Bible is not the universal church. We are the local church. The local church, one day, Man of Bible, I'm not talking about the building, I'm talking about the, the people, the, the body will not be here. So every authentic local assembly of believers, one day, will not exist in this world. So the local church is a temporary entity, but what we're connected to is a universal reality, that we're, we're, we're members of the body of Christ, and, and that will never pass away. And unfortunately, when, when the authentic believers are gone, somebody's going to be in here sitting in this building. The rapture of, of believers out of this world will empty, well, almost empty this building. Because there want, there's going to be some who will still come on Sunday morning who are not members. They may be members of, of manna, but they've never been connected to Christ intimately in the universal church. It is possible to be, to be a member of manna, a local assembly, and disconnected from Jesus Christ. Church membership is not what saves us. What saves us is, is our submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And he wants to be, what, what does he want? He wants it all. And he will not negotiate with you. He will not negotiate terms. What he wants, what he wants from you, what he wants from me, is an unconditional surrender of everything. Jesus said it this way. You want to be my disciple? I want, you to, I want you to turn your back on everything. I want you to go pick up a cross of death, die to yourself, pick up a cross, and then follow me. Authentic followers of Jesus Christ live a life of sacrifice. So to be saved is, is more than just joining man a Bible. We need to be vitally connected to Jesus Christ. What he does, he puts us in the universal church. I want to take you to 1 Corinthians 3, 12 and, and through 15. Listen to this. And, and now what I'm demonstrating again is just the, the vitality of the local church and why it is so important that you and I be connected. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it. What are we saying here? that people are at work in the body. And some of their work is gold, silver, and precious stone. Others are doing work, and their work is wood, hay, and stubble. So if you were to put gold, silver, and precious stone in fire, what would happen to it? Well, it would purify the gold, silver, and precious stone. But if you put wood, hay, and stubble in fire, what happens to it? It's going to burn up, meaning the value of their work is, is value. It has no value whatsoever. And there are a lot of people who are, are, who are just working with wood, hay, and stubble. And it means nothing to God because they're not vitally connected. 
the day, the day of God's judgment is like a day of fire where, where he will test the works. Look at this, because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Yet so is by fire. The, the summation of this is, is that in order, in order for your works, your endeavors, your connection in the local assembly to, to ha have value, it requires a, co a spiritual, intimate connect connection with the local church. Working, uh, using your gifts to expand the glory of Jesus Christ in the local assembly. I, I want to take you to these passages. Look, look with me at Hebrews, and we're just about done. And I, I want to read these passages, and then I want to give you some next steps, okay? And thank you for your patience. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, and we're just about done. So be patient. In Hebrews chapter 10, I, I think uh, Paul was the writer. That's my own opinion there. We, we, many, uh, we, we don't know for sure, but theories are out there about who the, the author of this particular letter was. I prefer Paul. It, it just has the flair, the, uh, the phraseology, the phrases there just seem like they're more of Paul than anybody else that I'm aware of. But look at verse 19. Are you there with me? Hebrews chapter 10. Are you there? Amen. Amen. Therefore, it, um, therefore, brothers, so clearly the writer is, is writing to who? Believers. That's right. Amen. Having boldness to enter the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us. Who's the us? Believers. Through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest, that is, we have a high priest in Jesus, who is over the house of God. What's the house of God? Isn't that the church? We have a high priest in Jesus Christ who is over God's church, the house of God. Look at verse 22. But, but before that, let, let, me, um, let me state this. Look, look at the passage. It says what? Let us do what? Draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Now, before I go on, I want you to understand um, um, historically what's going on. In, in the first century when this letter was written, there, there was only one letter. And the person reading it read it to a group of people. So here we are assembled here, and there are a number of Bibles that we have in this room. But in the first century, no one had this copy of this letter. This letter was sent by Paul to this group, and the man who was standing before them, he was telling them what Paul was saying, and he would elaborate on Paul's writing. But everyone there assembled had to listen. They didn't, they didn't read it for themselves. So one person was reading, everybody else was listening. And so the implication being this, that in God's design for corporate life, that the significance of the assembly is that the assembly should do this thing together. Look at the text. Let what? Us draw near. So drawing near to God first has to happen corporately. Do you, do you, see, do you see that? See, before I can draw near to God in my, in my individual walk, I first have to get connected corporately so that in the corporate life, I, I gain a strength and understanding to draw near to God, and then I learn how to practice it in my individual life. The, the reverse won't happen where I'm, I'm individually doing this and not connected corporately. Then you're not growing. You're not connected. You cannot grow if you're disconnected from the corporate life. The text says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. He says, let us. 
Then he says it again in verse 23. Let us hold fast. Verse 22 said, us, let, let us draw near. Verse 23 says, let us hold fast. This is not individual, an individual expression of faith. This is a corporate expression of faith. Holding fast the confession of our hope. So my hope, my hope was, was so encouraged by Jalen when I heard her sing, he wants it all. That's corporate life. We, we're using our gifts in one another's lives to do what? To hold fast. You try to hold fast on your own in, in living room Baptist by yourself? You're going to do just what the text says. Look at it. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without what? Wavering. See, standing alone, in your own, on your own, in your own place, not connected with the corporate body, you're going to waver. Because you're going to wind up listening to he, this one, that one, them, this, that, this, and, and the other. And all you have is a hodgepodge. And you'll never know the, the clear, coherent, cohesive purpose of God for your life. You, you will waver. Look at verse 24. And let us consider one another. Wow. Now, how do I do that in Living Room Baptist Church? Quite frankly, in Living Room Baptist Church, I ain't thinking about you. Right? Come on. When we're, when we're in pursuit of our own spiritual dimension and reality, individual, set apart for myself, I'm thinking about me and me only. But that's not how I grow. You know what my problem is? My problem is me. God wants to fix that selfish, carnal thinking about yourself. That's your problem. That's my problem. So what does he do? He fixes us, that whole, by putting us in a community of faith so that we'll learn to connect with other people. Let us consider one another. Wow, now there is, that's a stretch. Because the natural tendency is not to think about somebody else. It's just not nat. I do not get up naturally thinking about other people. From the day I was born, the one person I was thinking about was me. Every time I cried and begged for, it was me. Well, see, God wants to redeem us from our meology, from, from me. And me is taking a lot of people straight to hell because they, they're, they're so fixated on themselves. They can't think beyond their own circle of who they are. And they're lost in that dimension of I, I, I. The church is designed so that we can fix that hole. <laughs> the writer said, let us consider one another in order to stir up love. See, see what I'm saying? That happens in community. It happens in, in, in the body. That we may stir up love and good works. And here, how do we do that? Verse 25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Wow. Amen. Whoa, 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 whoa. How, how do I grow? Don't forsake your, don't forsake, don't, don't forsake the assembly. Stop, stop missing out. You, 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 you first Sunday and, and third Sunday worshipers. You know what I'm saying, right? There, there needs to be a consistent attendance to the things of God. And somehow or another, we convince ourselves that it's okay. He loves me. Well, the latter is true. He does love you, but it ain't okay. He loves us too much to leave us like we are. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Some, some people have this, this habit. Hit and miss. <laughs> hit and miss. <laughs> just hit and miss. And, and that, that, that is, it, it just portends, it, it just sets people up for um, 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 incoherent spiritual development. It, it just does. What, what builds strength in spiritual growth is consistency. Your hit and miss prayer life, that ain't going nowhere. Your hit and miss Bible study. When's the last time you actually picked up the Bible and spent some time with somebody else sharing the things of God? Hit and miss, hit and miss. 
on and off, up and down. It, it, that, that, that's, that, that sets us up for wavering. God, God calls us to consistency, but so that we can do what? The text says, exhorting one another. So you know what? I'm, I'm within the boundaries of my responsibility. Amen. I'm exhorting you. This, this is an exhortation because we're, we're responsible for exhorting one another so much the more. And the more, what? Gather even more frequently as that day of what day? The day of Christ's return. Amen. Spend more time together. Yes, wow. So, so the, these, and in fact, when I was reading through Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, I want to encourage you to read it. Uh, and, and you probably won't read it in one setting, but at least read it. But you'll see 13 of these let us. 13 times the writer says let us. It's, it's what's called in grammar a cohortative. It's a cohort. It's not let me. Singular. It's, a, it's the idea of the cohort. We are a cohort. So the cohort has to do this. I can't do this on my own. I can't, what? It says stir up love and good works. I can't do that. I, I'm encouraged when I see young Jalen sing. I'm encouraged when I see the praise team, when I see the guys standing there as, 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 as ushers. I, I'm encouraged when I see the activity through the week on Mondays and, and through the week on, on, um, uh, during the day when they're giving out food to the kids. That's so encouraging as we exhort one another. And all it does, it's like being on a boat fishing. <laughs> with, other, with other believers. It's such a rich, rich experience. It's a marvelous, marvelous experience. But let, let me get on to uh, next steps. Here are some next steps. One of those next steps is, is right here in, uh, in your hands. I hope everybody got a copy of this. The one another's. The one another's. If you don't have a copy, we'll get a copy for you. But I want you to take time and, and read through the, uh, the, 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 the setup, the paragraphing there. It's a list of exhortations for every member of the body, all right? And, and it's a wonderful uh, demonstration, illustration of the vibrancy of spiritual life. There are, now, I don't think I got them all, but I, I have 57 times the idea is stated one another. Now, let me ask you something in a practical sense. How can I fulfill this? Let, let, me, let me get back up. Do you think God wants me to do this? Now, why would you think that? It's in the Word. 50, 57 times this expression, one another. So what does that express to you? It expresses corporate life. And guess what? I can't do corporate life in Living Room Baptist Church. It, it just can't. How, how will you do this? If, if you, can, you certainly can't do it alone, right? Did somebody say that? You can't do it alone. If, if you're going to be true to what, what God has called us to, you, you, it demands, it demands, the scripture demands corporate life. The question is, how will we express the reality of this corporate mandate? Love one another. Be devoted to one another. How, how, how can I be devoted to you in Living Room Baptist? How, you, you see what I'm saying? It, in, in practical sense, the only way to do this is that the body, the local body, has to be vitally connected, life, doing life together. Amen. Here, here's a way to do that, one way. Um, get connected to the church's body life. We, we have a body life going on here at Manna, and one of the expressions of that body life is small group ministry. Many of our saints are not connected in a small group. See, the small group gives you the opportunity to express body life. Then you need to discover your spiritual gift. If you're a believer, you have a spiritual gift. You need to discover that, whatever that is. You need to discover why Jesus saved you and what he wants you to do. We can help you with that. And then third, once you discover your spiritual gift, you need to serve the body. My right hand got dirty this week. And for the life of me, my right hand just could not clean itself. Look at that. I needed my left hand. 
every body part in our physical body is put in the body to serve the other parts. No body part in your physical body is there for itself. The same is true spiritually. If you're saved, you're saved to serve. Serve the body. Um, I, I, I want to um, say this, and um, whatever you do, um, please, please don't tell Tracy, all right? Don't. I'm, I'm serious. Don't tell her, right? <laughs> um, but one, one of the ways I, I, I want to, and I, see, I'm saying that because I haven't mentioned it to her. Um, so I want to break it to her gently, right? Um, but but I, 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 want to, I want to help invigorate um, because, you know, we've started the small groups, but I want to help invigorate it a little more, the life, life in, together. And, and um, as, as uh, one of your pastors, um, I, I want to um, say to Tracy, Tracy, what would it be like if we maybe on a quarterly basis had uh, several of our members to come by our house? Until, until we went through the entire uh, membership body, wanting, wanting to show hospitality to every member of men. Now, if, if we did it on an individual basis, I guess it would take another 10 years, right? But if we, if we did it in, in groups, in small groups, just, just bringing groups of people to our home just to spend time together, get connected, and just to, to pray with each other, all, all I'm saying is um, we, we, we need to find ways, creative ways, to, to invigorate life in the body. And it's all for the health of the body. It's to help stimulate health in the body. One of the risks I have, and, and I'm done, forgive me, but um, one, of, one of the risks I have as a diabetic is my... my um, my numbers, my, my glucose numbers, need to stay low. And those of you who are diabetics know this. You need to, you need to um, eat right, exercise, and, and take med medication if, if you have to. Um, but keeping the glucose low, it keeps the, the glucose. Um, diabetics uh, have a problem because their, their body uh, d does not um, metabolize the, the sugar. And I don't mean... Um, uh, domino sugar. I mean, the body, the producing body, it's called body glucose. And it doesn't, it doesn't um, uh, metabolize the sugar properly. And it needs help. And so when it doesn't metabolize, the, the blood thickens. The blood thickens in, in, in the body. And, and one of the um, outcomes, one of the um, f things that happens in, for diabetics when, when it comes to your, your feet and your toes, where the capillaries are, are so small, you think about your, your little toe, your big toe is so far away from your heart, it takes the heart, you know, pumping the blood down there, but if those capillaries being so small and the blood is so thick, then blood flow is hindered in terms of getting to that lower part, those lower extremities. So as a diabetic, I, have, I run the risk of possibly losing appendages. Toes, feet, legs, and, and diabetics go through this. Amen. Diabetics have to maintain their, their metabolism. And, and one way is exercise, take medication, and, and um, eating right. Amen. And if, if that doesn't happen, then we lose appendages. Our eyes, we lose eyesight, visual, because thick blood can't go through the lens. And I said all of that to say what? That, that um, in, ter in terms of maintaining vitality, what we want to do is, is create blood flow. What? Spiritual connectivity. Because if, if we don't continue to connect and connect more vitally, then the flow of the spirit through the body is going to be hindered. And then, then we start losing, losing parts. And, and we, we don't, we don't want to lose uh, membership. We don't want to lose people. We want to stay connected. And, and so with that, I just want to encourage you. And we, we, we really do want to go after this with all the vigor that's in us, especially as we see 
the day approaching. Father, I thank you for the time that we've spent um, looking at these uh, matters from your word. So appreciate you. And, and maybe in our midst, there are some who, who don't know you authentically and genuinely. We're praying for them even now, right now, and just praying that um, they've heard something and, and they, their interest has been piqued. And I want to pray for them. So every head is bowed, every eye is closed. If, if, I, if I can pray for you about your um, spiritual connectivity, there, there's something that you, you recognize, you know, something's missing, just like that, that hole in the ceiling. You know it's there. And, and somehow or another, you, you don't know what to do. If that sounds like something you need prayer for, would you stick your hand up? I want to pray for you. No one's looking. Um, only I, I'll see it. I will see. I will see your hand. Praying for you. Is there someone else? Uh, is someone else? I'm, I'm praying for you. Praying. Anyone else? Praying for you. Father, I, I thank you so much for the hands, um, the, the honesty and trans, um, transparency of people who recognize um, what, what each of us knows is our reality, that we've got holes, and, and it just needs fixing. It needs, it needs your careful, it needs your careful love. And I pray for those whose hands were up. I'm praying for their, their spirits, oh God, that they'll come, that you by your spirit will draw them to this place of, of connectivity in Jesus. Uh, maybe you're a believer looking for a church home. If manna, you, you think manna is, is possibly a place where you'd like to, to at least learn to see if it's, if it's viable for you. We, I want to pray for you. Um, if you're thinking about it and, and you want prayer, would you just raise your hand? Well, Lord, I thank you so much for our time here and uh, for your mercies that you've expressed. Thank you for your people, and thank you for all that has happened in this place this day. In the precious name of Jesus.